Hi, this is Matt Gresick. I'm coming with you for another episode of Brick and Mortar, Education from the Inside Out. I'm Eric Ebersole, sitting here alongside Matt. Happy to be with you guys again as we bring to you yet another <laughs> educator who is uh, from inside a building and knows what it's like. And uh, we, have a, we have a little different thing for you this time. Uh, tonight's focus will be on, on a whole area of education, Department of Defense education. And um, we're going to talk about a couple of things there. But uh, we have uh, Chad Jimison with us tonight, and we're pleased to have him here. And we'll just start off with you tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, you know why you chose education and maybe you know, why you chose to be an educator where you are. Well, thank you for letting me come on here. Um, I'm excited. I'm an educational technologist, so I'm the technology coach for my school, um, kind of an in-house staff developer on technology. And I'm at an elementary middle school at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, um, Chad, we're going to get we're going to go right to number two. Uh, what is your most difficult slash challenging, funniest or most rewarding moment in education? In other words, what event sticks out in your mind, memory the most? Uh, it's story time, Chad. Go ahead whenever you're ready. <laughs> this can be riveting and heart-wrenching, <laughs> or it can be damn funny if you want it to be. It doesn't matter. I don't know. I mean, I was, this is a hard question for me because like every year there's something that is magical or exciting, or and it, it's hard to narrow it down after 21 years <laughs> of teaching. Um, so I just kind of went, I'm going to run through a list real quick, but like the first few things that popped in my mind when, when I, when you uh, heard this question was my very first year, 9-11, I was on a field trip with middle schoolers and we had no idea what was going on. We were at a, actually we were at a, uh, army base. Um, it was an army school in North, Northern Georgia. And all of a sudden the, our ESP, our, our school bus drivers started like, telling us to get back to the buses, get back to the buses. And we we're like, we don't know. You know, we had cell phones, but we didn't know what was going on. And um, we had no communication, cell phones weren't working, but luckily our bus drivers had radios and they could radio each other to their main office, to the school and uh, get us back. But I was just like, you know, first year teacher, I had no idea what was going on. And just, it was uh, a crazy experience and just having to to deal with that. Next thing was um, when I was stationed in Germany, that's probably like my third year teaching um, at an army base there. I'm just driving to work one day and I'm driving on my way to school and I'm driving past the castle and I'm just thinking to myself, how did I get here? You know, <laughs> it was just. Because there are lots what, of castles here. I know. I'm like, what am I doing here? Yeah. You know, it was, just a, 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 it was just that moment of like where am I, you know? <laughs> and then um, probably just a, like probably two years ago, um, I was wearing a first day of school, had a little um, pronouns, um, like sticker on my shirt, just like first day, you know, as a new teacher, you know, you're introducing yourself and a student as they're coming in saw my sticker and was like, thank you for wearing that. And my pronouns are they, them, you know, just that moment of acceptance and they know they're in a safe space. So just little moments like that over the years, um, it's hard to narrow it down, but those were just like the top three that popped into those my really, head. <laughs> this is three, Wait. the middle one is funny. The other two are pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah. It makes me think that, you know, we do ones where we interview teachers and give them a minute or so. We should probably do one to have people who have been teaching a long time talk about what 9-11 was like for them that day yeah in school, almost lots of people were already in school when that yeah. all occurred. yeah so that'd yeah, be a, right. that'd be a heck of an episode but the other one about you're talking about school being a safe space we've talked about this mm -hmm. we, uh, we we had an episode right before this about uh, banning books and how there's the the school should be a safe space for that kind of understanding and exploration and so um uh, it's good to hear you say that as well uh, well, that just leads into our third question, and I'm sure our listeners are right now wondering where the heck does Chad teach at where he can see <laughs> castles and stuff like that on his daily drive. So um, you teach at a Department of Defense Dependent School, or DODS for short. Uh, right. Can you just explain uh, why that's special and how it's different from other schools? And let's just clarify, you're not actually in the military. You are hired by the military or hired by Correct. a branch of the military to to educate right. students. 
And I have so no you are, connection. You are a teacher in the best sense of the word. There's <laughs> there's no conflict of interest here. Y'all correct. <laughs> yeah, I knew nothing about military schools. I didn't know that they existed growing up. Um, even the connection to military. My dad was drafted, and we didn't even learn that he was in the Vietnam War until I was probably in high school. It was something wow. kind of kept secret. Um, so I have no connection to military, but um, but our schools. And actually, the name has changed. Um, we are Department of Defense Education Activity, otherwise known as DODIA. Oh. Um, DODIA is our like main headquarters. And we were divided into two parts. DODS, which you mentioned, was the overseas portion. And then we had the, the stateside portion, which was DDES. So we had two separate systems. But now we're under this one umbrella, one, we call ourselves like one DODIA now, um, which includes all of the schools around the world. So they're basically just public schools that are plopped down on, on military bases um, around the world. You know, we have, I think it's like 11 different countries around the world, plus stateside, plus Guam, plus Puerto Rico. Um, we have schools um, functioning just like a regular public school um, everywhere else. The only thing different about us is we're not run by Department of Education. All of our funding and all of our initiatives, everything is done through Department of Defense. So um, like, you know, with funding, everything, it all comes through Department of Defense and nothing goes through uh, Department of Ed. So, um, and yeah, so uh, right now I was, oh, I was in Germany on an army base. Then I moved to Korea. So you can still be president, right? Just checking. Yes, I can okay. still be president. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if I had kids, they could still be president if they were right. in a foreign yeah. country. <laughs> Winner. <laughs> but I got two chihuahuas, so, you know. They can. <laughs> they can. <laughs> I love the fact that, like, you, you had to correct me with the acronyms at first. And yeah. I can imagine the Department of Defense and public education with their love of acronyms, just like yes. combining. And, and I mentioned we, your- Yeah, we used to get at the beginning of the year and it was kind of like sent by the, the district office. And it was like a five page long list of acronyms just to be familiar with all the acronyms we use on the education side plus the DOD side. So, <laughs> <laughs> And then you have to learn ranks. Learning ranks is another thing that's really hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not one of my strengths and one of my colleagues who is a, a former Marine he gets a right. little frustrated with me. But I just ask him, like, which one's higher? And he gets all yeah. mad at me. But you know them, don't you? So I have a you. picture next to my desk. <laughs> <laughs> a <laughs> reference card. Because <laughs> I gotta do all the all the all of them, you know, Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, you know, we got them all. Yeah. And they're all little, yeah. Well, never mind. I should not like I know anything about it. I don't. Um, I haven't studied. Um, right. so, it, it, so it's very different for you, in other words, and you spent your entire career teaching in one of these schools. So yes. the who you answer to or where the rules come from or where the guidance comes from, it's just a little different for you. Do you sense talking to other teachers that you're significantly different or do you feel like it, it feels somewhat the same to you? That's a hard question to answer, but I'm wondering if it's... It feels different. I mean, when I go, <laughs> like, I mean, I do a lot with NEA, um, National Education Association, I do a lot with them. And so sometimes when I'm in the room, I'm like, uh, that doesn't really pertain to me or that policy doesn't doesn't come to our schools. Like the No Child Enough Behind, that never came to us. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the initiatives that come through Department of Ed never come to us. We might get a version of it or it's our own version or something similar, but um, a lot of the, the the initiatives and stuff through Department of Ed that's happening in all the other 50 states. I don't know uh, what else you have to deal with, but I think teachers that are listening are like, well, that's attractive. Maybe. No, <laughs> I know. That's it is. Funny. It is. There's it's probably other dot I's you have to dot and T's you have to cross. Correct. There. We have our but own. still, it just it was like, no, no, no child no, left behind. No, no child left behind. No, right. right. <laughs> How horrible. <laughs> well, that what that means? It's time for our phone call. We have a phone call? Yes, we have a phone call. I, you know, I'm always a little surprised we have a phone call because, you know, I know we have a lot of listeners, but they're shy and uh, I love when they call in. So do we have a caller on right now? Yes, we have a caller not on right now. Caller, can you tell us who you are? Ellie, can you speak up and say your name again? All right. Thank you. All right. So, Ellie, what is your question? 
Hey, Matt, we're not, I'm not hearing her at all right now. Yeah, she's coming. She's not coming in very good. I believe her question was, how would a government shutdown affect uh, schooling? Yeah, we've come face to face with government shutdowns hmm. in thank the last you, decade. Sorry we can't hear you. The connection's bad, but thank you so yeah, much. In the last few years, um, partial government shutdowns, and uh, sometimes we've been threatened in 2023 with full government shutdowns. So the question hmm. is, right, how uh, would that affect you and the communities you serve? Uh, it, it affects us immensely. We have, I mean, when I was, you know, if a government shutdown happens, you know, I'm quick. I'm always on the news, hitting refresh on my computer to see if it's going to happen or not. Um, first, the first thing that happens is to students. All extracurricular stops. That's football. That's after school academic programs. That's like math, math team, right? Math, math team. team. Anything. Thank you. That I'm happens. a math teacher. Four yes. math teachers. So I have to point that out. Yes. Math elite, if you will. Math elite. <laughs> yes. Uh, my uh, robotics <laughs> club would stop. You know, so everything stops after school, um, and so that's a, a, a huge hit to our students. Um, school still goes on. You know, we're still required to have school during a shutdown, but that's the main thing that hits the students. Now, the teacher side, uh, we go to the school, we teach as normal, but we don't know if we're going to get paid. We yeah. don't get paid, you know, we will get paid when the budget passes, but if it goes longer than two weeks, because we're paid on a biweekly basis, then it gets deferred and it just waits and waits. So that's the kind of the, the struggle for us. Is so like, would, would they make you whole when the budget's done or is that the They will. On? Yeah, they will make you whole okay. when it comes across as just that unknownness you know because you're living on the bills. edge yeah you know, I mean, on they, any edge yeah. then <laughs> you're having your having your uh your income dry up could yeah. be a huge problem and then you, as you say kids are going to suffer because schools are more than just classes obviously right. a lot yeah. of other stuff it's very so hard. it would be fair to say that a, a government shutdown that could be happening close to this episode when we mm -hmm. air it would hurt military families Definitely. And I mean, it, it's not just us that, you know, all the soldiers, everybody that right. is on a military base, this goes to soldiers, to teachers, to administrators, the people that work on the base as civilians, that's everybody's pay would be deferred. And because it always happens around this October time period, if it goes longer, you're going into now the holidays and yeah. that can really hit the next one hard, you know. Um, if it's close to the holidays, you're like, do I spend money for my children's gifts or do I wait until I get paid? You know, it's like, you don't know. <laughs> Can I pay the car insurance? Correct. Can I pay the house? No. Can I, you know, all the things. So, but luckily, I mean, there are some, you know, a lot of the banks are usually, you know, understanding of our situation and you can get some relief usually through the banks, but you know, that's not guaranteed all the time. So um, it's just kind of a waiting game to see what happens. And, and let's be clear, this we're not just talking about, you, you teach here in the States, state yes. yeah. but that would affect people around the world, right? Correct. Okay, yep. would, yeah. the impact would be felt everywhere as far yeah. as Department of Defense uh, schools go. Yeah, and right now we're in the middle of like, let's say football season. So like our students that are at Fort Campbell, we have a big football team there and they play local high schools in that area. If the let's say a shutdown happens, that means all their games, their practices, everything stops, which means that might put them at a disadvantage for, you know, going to like state championship or anything, because you have to have so many games and so many practices to go to the, you know, next levels and things like that, or it might fall, depends on when the next sport's going to come in, if it's a winter sport. So, um, you know, it just hurts the community and, yeah. you know, they don't, think about all the repercussions that it happens all I, the know, way down think, to the kid I think level the dominoes that fall <laughs> yeah and, and we see the education dominoes that drop down here yeah um you know so yeah it's not a good thing at all no question thank you for that answer yeah all right so military schooling a lot of people don't know what it is what, what department of schools are so what do you feel like a, a misconception is what is something <laughs> Eric Ebersole or Matt Gressick probably believe about military schooling that might, we're much more, we're much more of a minded, but someone <laughs> like us might believe that you think um, you might need, you would like to correct or what misconception would you like to? Uh, well, even misconceptions with the kids when they move overseas to a school, they, they hear military school and they think they're going to a military <laughs> run like run school. Like they're going to have to be like little They're going to be marching in formation. Yes. Have, have you ever had a student that saluted you? <laughs> 
no, no, no. I've never uh, had that. But like, I've had kids that are new coming in, like that, like like in Korea or or, or Germany, um, that are new to our system. Because a lot of kids, let's say if they're from Texas or Colorado and they're going to a regular public school and they come over to our schools and it's a new experience for them. You know, a lot of times they're like, I didn't realize it was just a school. Like they're thinking <laughs> like in their head, a military school um, run by that. But um, but also a lot of people think our schools are international schools. They're not an international school. They're not run like an international school with international baccalaureates and things like that, or a curriculum that might be a British curriculum or um, another curriculum. We are American curriculum, public school, you know, so. Very cool. That's good. Thank you. Thanks All right. So we're going to have a little fun. Uh, okay. We're going to ask you what is, if you were king for a day and you had the opportunity <laughs> to change any mascot of a school that you've attended or that you've taught at, worked at, you can change that mascot right now uh, on this podcast with just, you know, a thought. So what <laughs> would it be and why? Uh, so this is kind of weird, but I worked at it. So the, the schools I worked at in Seoul, um, we had three schools. We had an elementary, a middle school, and a high school, all on the, the uh, base, an army base in, in Seoul. And I worked at actually all three of them. So the elementary school there were the Dolphins. The middle school was the Bulldogs. And the high school was the Falcons. And I, when I first got there, I was like, what does dolphins and dual dogs and like what does it have to do with korea like i figured you know some schools would have like a local you know mascot or something like that and i i always wanted to change it I went, well, it should be something different you know like a dragon or uh you know something you know like something that matches the culture of the the the, the system but when now when we were, we had to close those schools about four five four or five years ago we had to close all the schools because we moved all, out of Seoul uh, the army's moving out of the Seoul area and moving south so we closed all the schools so I got put in charge of finding the history and putting a video together and all that stuff but you actually uh, were king for a day I was king for a day <laughs> so um, I talked to a teacher that had been there for many years I had to like find it was like an old principal that I was retired. And he told he knew the history of the mascots. If you don't, if you've seen the Korean flag, you, there's four symbols on the flag. There's yep. on the four corners, and it's like one's fire, earth, air, and water. It's like the four symbols of, and they mean other things like that. But that's kind of the basis of what they mean. So back then, when they were naming the school, they chose the the students chose mascots of the three elements. Oh, cool! So once I knew why, you know, then I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So the elementary chose a dolphin for water, the bulldog for land, and the falcon for air. We didn't okay. have a fire one, but you know, then then it made sense. So I would I would say I wanted to change it, and I thought it didn't make sense, but after. Uh, learning I thought you know that does make sense so that is good so it's kind of a I didn't answer your question no, but you it's did, kind of a little actually. history people answer it all kinds of ways <laughs> you, went, you went to a circle to it which was very cool <laughs> but well, that, when you first read them that was my thought is they weren't yeah. they were sort of disjointed yeah list and actually they're not they're connected yeah yeah well, very cool. Um, I, like Chad, I got to know you through the NEA, and one of the cool stories that I have about you is we were all going to go to karaoke, uh, all the new directors. And, and Matt uh, has a beautiful voice. I, I just, I it's, it, it, it's like a mix of Jesus and Fergie. <laughs> and so, and so uh, but Chad said, you know what, Matt, I, I live in Korea and I'm good. I, I I I do that enough. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> had enough experience with that. We call it Norebang in Korea, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you've been wonderful uh, here. Thank you so much for what you do and what for you do for those kids on those military bases and uh, and those families you serve because you're just like I, I've been so impressed with you working with you at the end. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to meet you here and nice to have you on board. And thank you. I think um. Yeah, you've you've clarified a few things that uh, it's kind of a mystery. So we really appreciate you uh, sorting those out for us a little bit. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You bet. This is Brick and Mortar, Education from the Inside Out. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with yet another episode where we grab another dedicated education professional from out of a building to tell us about what they do. And with that, see you That's soon. It. Take care.